Hey guys, welcome back to A-Level Lessons. In this next part of our physical jog series, we're going to be looking at floods again. It's actually the last part on floods where we'll be wrapping up with looking at the strategies to manage floods. So in the previous two parts, we've already looked at um, your causes of floods as well as the effects of floods. So to end it off, let's look at what are the strategies we can actually implement in the event that a flood does occur. How should we manage it? So we're going to be looking at these two concepts over here of different types of strategies uh, within uh, flood management. It is known as the hard engineering strategies as well as the soft engineering strategies. So basic definition is that hard engineering involves strategies that are tangible. So we're looking at things that are like artificial structures. It can be seen and it is there to actually uh, physically protect against a flood. Right, when you look at soft uh, engineering strategies, we're looking at things that are intangible. So they are also more sustainable and they are usually more of uh, policy-based. Right, They don't ex- ac- actually physically prevent the flood from getting worse. They are more of initial responses as well as strategies behind the scenes that can help in managing a flood. So let's look at what the hard engineering strat- uh, strategies are first, what the various hard engineering strategies so firstly, we have got levees and embankments, right? These are essentially like barriers, right? Think of them as barricades. So levees that are raised on river banks, they actually increased, uh, increase the height of the river banks and they prevent the river from exceeding bank full discharge. So it's a low cost strategy, right? These can act as barriers, they can act as, um, like, like I say, it's levees, you can lift it up. Uh, it's also low cost, especially when you use things like sandbags, Uh, basic infrastructure these are of a lower cost and one issue with them is that they actually require constant maintenance and strengthening to ensure that the entire um, all of these embankments right are actually effective still effective so that's one of the downsides right but if not it is a good strategy in being that physical protection against a flood when it does occur Next up will be dams and reservoirs, where we've all heard of these before. So they essentially store excess water, right? They store excess rainwater and they reduce the impact of the floods, right? By reducing the level of water in the river channel in that immediate region. So they may not provide full flood control, right? As all dams have lifespans and are limited by the durability of construction materials. So when you look at dams, you look at reservoirs, right? We've heard of dam failures before, right? When the dam starts to go through wear and tear, it starts to fall apart, right? It can actually have um, a failure, which results in even more water being leaked out, which can cause greater flash floods instead. So that would be the downside. If not, it is a good way of storing excess water and, and even generating hydropower as well, which some of you guys have learned in your human geography. Next would be channel realignment. So this is something new that I don't think a lot of you guys have heard before. It is like the name suggests, realignment of the river channel. So very simply, we are going to modify the channel by realigning it. So this actually helps to increase the velocity of the water and it directs floodwaters away from important areas or low-lying areas. So essentially when a, uh, let's say the com- the organization behind mitigating floods, the government, when they identify that there are certain areas in the area which are low-lying, right, meaning that they are more susceptible to flooding, what happens is that we can actually uh, direct the floodwaters away by realigning the channel. So it, for example, if you look at this picture, right, it kind of like creates this cutoff Right, this artificial cutoff here, which actually prevents a certain plot of low-lying land to fall prey to any sort of flood if it does occur. So that's the, the good thing about channel realignment. Uh, only issue is that it requires extra land space. Right, It could get in the way of certain houses, especially those rural areas. Right, If not, it is a good way to direct floodwaters away to kind of like increase the overall uh, drainage um capacity right the channel capacity to hold more water instead last one would be channel dredging right so channel dredging is also something you've heard never heard before right so it keeps the channel free from sediments 
it increases the channel depth and the capacity to hold channel flow, hence allowing for more water to pass through. So what channel dredging does, right? Like you've heard of dredging before, right? It kind of like helps to expand and increase this area of the, the channel for more water to actually pass through. Hence, it will not reach the bankful discharge as quickly, right? You are essentially um, increasing this bankful discharge level. So it also reduces sedimentation, right? Which is basically when sand and silt form, start to fill up in channels, they start to clog the channel. Right, it causes a piling up of water, so it helps to actually prevent this channel dredging. So this can be an effective policy. Right, only issue is that it could also be costly. Right, so we need to be mindful of uh, where we actually dredge the channel as well. Moving on to our soft engineering strategy. So these are strategies that does not directly impact the river. We are not cutting out a section of the river anymore. We are not putting in things. We're not putting up barricades, right? We're looking at softer strategies. So firstly, land use zoning. So like the name suggests, zoning, I think during this um, pandemic period, a lot of us have heard of this term zoning, right? So it involves dividing the floodplain into areas which experience different degrees of flood risk. So like it suggests, we are zoning it apart. So when there are areas with higher risk, right, it would actually have lesser developments, right? It is kind of like a law. It's a regulation that is put in place right, whereby areas which are zoned out as being of a higher risk would only be allowed to build a certain quota of developments. So this allows for increased flood proofing and flood insurance. Uh, benefits is that it can be highly effective in managing floods. Right, it does address the root cause of flooding in certain areas, especially low-lying areas which are of the highest risk. Uh, limitations is that it may not be realistic for existing urban areas, right? Because the areas which are of higher risk may require the people to be relocated. And relocating people is always um, a costly issue, right? So it will be an issue that comes at a high cost. It is not actually very feasible. Next one will be evacuation. So this is more of an immediate solution. So it involves the people and property being removed from the flood hazard area, right, through the creation of evacuation plans and backups as well. So it requires adequate flood warning systems for effectiveness, right? The people must know in the first place that they need to evacuate, right? They have to be prepared. So it requires all these flood warning systems. And the effectiveness also will improve only with increased warning time. So if there's an area whereby there is no signal, no sort of warning at all that there is a flood coming, definitely the people will be unprepared. And they may not, even though there may be evacuation plans, they may not actually follow through with it because they are unaware to begin with. All right, last one uh, would actually, or second last, I think, would be loss sharing. So this includes insurance and flood aid. So we're looking more at both pre and post flood, right? We are preparing for the worst. So disaster aid refers to any aid and equipment, staff and technical assistance that is given to an immediate region after the disaster. So in your developed countries, insurance is an important loss sharing strategy. Uh, only issues that not all households have insurance. So insurance is good because people pay a premium to essentially protect their stuff in the event of a flood. So this can be good in loss sharing. Uh, in LDCs, they tend to lack insurance and flood it, right? I mean, essentially because of the nature of ineffective government, uh, they may not actually have enough disposable income for insurance as well. So they may actually require more of your regional as well as international assistance. Um, should there be an event of a flood. So limitations would be that it, this may actually encourage people to continue living on floodplains, right, the high-risk areas, instead of finding lower-risk areas to actually develop. So this can result in dire consequences when another flood does hit, for example. So it is important that loss sharing, um, although yes, it is a crucial strategy, right, it may actually right, be, be rendered ineffective if people are complacent and you do not actually um, care much about their life because they think that it is already protected. So evaluation for this entire topic is simple. 
Um, and end of the day, soft engineering strategies would definitely be the preferred choice over hard engineering strategies, right? Because proper st- uh, soft engineering strategies can actually greatly minimize the impacts of any sort of flood, right? If we have got the necessary evacuations in place, we've got land use zoning already to begin with, chances are that these high risk areas which are prone to floods will not even have people to begin with. Um, so hard engineering strategies are more of a second line of defense based strategy. Um, nonetheless, there is a need for a two prong approach, right? We should always be equipped with the know hows of how to evacuate. We should be prepared with our insurance, any sort of loss sharing policies and strategies so that in the event that it does occur, um, if our soft engineering strategies fail, we always have our hard engineering strategies to rely on. So for your exam requirements, very, very simple. Just be able to explain and discuss the various hard and soft engineering strategies in managing floods and use your evaluation techniques where required to assess the effectiveness of such strategies. So at the end of the day, always remember we want to adopt uh, a holistic approach. We would try to adopt both approaches, hard and soft. Um, Although if, I mean, as far as possible, government should always ensure that soft strategies are made the priority. So that would be everything that you need to know about strategies for your flood management. So if you have any questions, you can leave it in the comment section below. I will answer them. If not, if you did enjoy this video, be sure to give it a like as well as to subscribe to the channel. It really does help me out a lot. And if not, I'll see you guys in the next part very, very soon. All right, see you guys then. Bye-bye.